Hello everyone, Guyan here from Genome Studios with another O3DE Intensive. Uh, this one's going to be on the recast gem for pathfinding and basic AI to use that pathfinding for some sort of purpose. Uh, now, um, I didn't say this in the last intensive, but uh, these intensives are oriented around uh, people who already have video game development experience and don't quite need the step-by-step -step guides, but rather the beats and the understandings of this particular engine in relation to game development. Um, I cover everything as best as I can, but I go quickly so that we can just get it over with. So the very first thing we're going to want to do is configure our project to have the recast gem. Um, so we'll search recast, and this one is uh, provided uh, directly, so you don't need to download or update it or anything. Um, you just click ready and click save and now this messages uh, this message notifies you that it's going to uh, draw the recast navigation code from github uh, when you build the project and therefore fetch the content so that is also fine make sure you have an internet connection i guess is the important part um, we likely need to rebuild um, so let's build the project build now um, while that goes um, just a little overview we're going to be using the recast uh, nav mesh system to essentially scan over our environment um, and it essentially builds a mesh um, vertices and faces whatever have you um, on the surface that then you can trace a line along to get from one point of that surface to another um, and that is uh, the very common way by which most games do pathfinding um, of course there's different algorithms and, and procedures to it in the sense of um, uh, there you can do like grid based node based um, other kinds of ones but recast is a very common one for uh, 3d game environments simply because it is a mesh in 3d space as opposed to um, a very complicated arrangement of voxels or grid points or what have you um, so let's just get back into the tutorial here i'm going to just while i'm here make a new folder and we're going to call it uh, basic ai recast Good. Um, it's a good start. Basic AI work. Okay. okay. So um, let's get recast started um, so that we can begin understanding what's happening. So very first and foremost, let's just, just create an entity and we're going to call this recast. And we're going to start populating it with recast things. Recast. Recast. So we get our navigation match and it requires some stuff. So let's get the phys PhysX provider. Um, this allows the navigation mesh to get physics collisions <laughs> um, to discern the, the surfaces. And then lastly, um, we need an axis line box shape, which will be our bounds for the scan. So I'm gonna just give this 50 and 50 and 50. Um, note that the height um, only needs to um, in, encapsulate like the surfaces of things. And so if you have a height this high, you would do it for the purpose of being able to capture things that are in elevation as well. Um, not a big deal, just something to uh, understand. Um, so we can turn on the editor preview here and you'll see, plunk, all of a sudden, oh, my keyboard, there we go. All of a sudden you can see that it's generated four quads, uh, four quarters, um, and uh, it's there. But this is a little sneaky thing. You think that because it's here and it has the preview here and everything's all good, that it must just auto-generate, right? Like when you turn it on, it's within these bounds, it's just gonna be tracking what's inside here. But that's not actually the case. We're actually going to be responsible for telling it to update. Um, this is one of the biggest hurdles in making this work. Um, so let's get to it. Um, script canvas, and then we can open that. And we can click Control N for a new thing. Control Shift Save to save as. Uh, ooh, we're in um, deep in this. Uh, let's go to my other project, but then come out, then go to Intensives, Assets, Basic AI Recast. Here we go. Now what am I doing? Oh yeah, we're making an auto recast script. Um, so obviously auto means automatically, and so we're going to get it on um, Graph Start. Good. <laughs> All right, tutorial's over, we're, we're ready to go. <laughs> no, um, according to the uh, documentation, the best pattern for this is to, um, we're on recast here, is to go uh, update nav mesh async 
Um, asynchronous means that it is just going to um, start running while everything else continues to process in the startup. And then we are going to track an event called on navigation mesh updated. And we're going to connect into this. So what this means is that as we go through, we're going to tell it to update. And right after we tell it to start updating, we're going to say, OK, we're going to watch for when it's done. Um, and so then we can come out here and we can go print and we can go uh, nav mesh mesh done um, processing. And so we have graph start update thing and go. We're going to click save, go down here. And we're going to go auto recast. Good, good, good. Um, and then we're going to go here. I'm going to turn off the editor preview, but then I'm going to turn on debug draw because this is the equivalent, but in play. And we're going to click save and let's see what happens. Here we go. Um, the uh, level pops in and the nav mesh is there, it turns out. Um, now I want to give a small caveat because this is only working because the level is so small. But in the process of starting the game, there are some frames by which the level is just a void. It doesn't have any surfaces. Um, so if we, I don't know, just take the ground. I'm going to just try this. Duplicate it and move it down and then duplicate it and then move it down and then duplicate it. I'm just going to try and smother the project with a little bit more um, stuff that has to start up because this was the second issue that I was having is that I have my level and I had it properly scanning via, via the documentation. Everything was quote unquote right. <laughs> Let's see if this works. And as you can see, the nav mesh didn't load this time because it took too long for the level to become existent. And so the nav mesh literally scanned the world of nothing. So it hit no points, it made no surface contacts. So the nav mesh is made out of zero points. Great. <laughs> so how do you handle this? Well, all we need to do is um, on graph start here, we just need to do a small time delay. So we go time, delay, enter. This is ticks at first. So let's, I don't know, let's start with one just for funsies. Um, likely it's not enough uh, once you start in getting into large games. In fact, what you'd probably want to have is a startup sequence that fires a startup successfully done, game is ready, and then you do the nav mesh process. But that's too advanced for this tutorial. You're a game developer, you should do it. Um, and here we are. So uh, by putting a small delay in front of the navigation request, you're actually giving it time for the level to become existent uh, before, you know, we hit these hurdles. So I'm going to take one of these grounds and I'm going to, just for some uh, uniqueness, where is the primitive collide, blah, 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 mesh? Oh, it's a ground plane. Okay, well. Boo, okay. We're not going to use those. We're going to just make a, our own square. So we're going to create a blocker wall, right? Because uh, we want to block things. So we're going to go uh, box shape so that we don't have to like have a mesh of a box. We're going to go, uh, oh, we do have a, we need a mesh of a box. Um, shape collider. It requires a, we'll do static rigid body because it's just going to be a thing in the world. And I had said we want a mesh. <laughs> I was wrong. We do want a mesh. And we're going to go box one by one. That's pre-built. There we go. And now I'm going to go <clears throat> to my add non-uniform scale. And we're going to go X is long wise. We're going to go like, let's go 10. Okay. All right, so we're going to go, no, you know what, let's go 15. Good. Um, so we've got our wall here. And if we wanted to, for the sake of uh, not going crazy, we can save, go to recast, turn on the editor preview. And oh, we see that it's actually uh, scanning over the thing. So um, we can go here. We can go to um, agent height is 2, agent max climb. We're going to make that point 0.3. There we go. And then agent radius is way skinnier. I don't know a game where they're 0.6 of a meter. Um, maybe go, Gears of War. So now we have our block. We have our uh, 
everything set up, ready to start actually understanding things. So <laughs> I'll give you a little insight. I recorded a one hour tutorial of this exact tutorial and forgot a very, very important thing. So recast is the system that casts the mesh into the world and finds out what the surface is. But recast actually isn't responsible for pathfinding at all. <laughs> There's an additional component that when you type recast, they don't have it on the list. It's so annoying. But there's a detour navigation component. And the detour navigation component is what takes the nav mesh and actually finds the path and the route. <laughs> and that's what I missed. Um, so in the instructions, they say the detour navigation component can be on every unit. And they can then find their own nav. But it can also just be on a, on a core source thing that then when things need to find their navigation, they can just ask the, like that manager, the navigation master. So we're going the ladder. We're making a navigation master just for now. Um, if you wanted other stuff or deeper complexities, you may want to do a solo uh, detour on every unit. But for now, we're just going to do this. We're going to select the self for the navigation mess. And this nearest distance is if you're saying, uh, you know, select someone out here and there's no path that you can get there, uh, it will find the point within three units, uh, in this case meters, I guess, of it. Um, now, <laughs> here's another funny little thing. When I did the tutorial earlier, well, and I'm going to show you now, uh, our controller is separate from our unit. And so in order to allow AI uh, control of things, we uh, make an AI controller that can cont control any units just like we can. Um, so I'm going to make a unit for us to make into our AI unit, which is nice. And it's just the one that I've been using all throughout this tutorial. So um, all you really need is a unit that can be controlled by input. Um, and as long as that input is defined, then we can hook into it with our AI. But when you're trying to find your path on this little uh, auto recast startup little mechanism, because we're just doing tutorials, it's gonna you're gonna try and find from your character's point to the destination. But hey, the character's more than three meters above the surface of the thing, and that actually doesn't apply within the um, the detour. So if it's the five meters or six or seven that's above the ground, it's going to try and find a path and it's not going to find a path. So I'm going to do two things. I'm going to make the nearest distance a little bit wider, <laughs> just so that we have a bit of a grace. And then on our AI unit, I'm going to be really have the foresight to put him nearly over the ground. <laughs> so now he is within five meters when he spawns. So if he tries to find a path right when he spawns, it's not going to come out zero. <laughs> One of the many other little fussy little things about getting this to work. Of course, again, you'd have a nice startup sequence. You'd spawn the character, make sure they're on the ground, and then set the, all that stuff up um, with a more complicated game system. But we're not there yet. So I already kind of outlined it, but the real meat and potatoes of what we're doing is we're going to be making an AI controller. Um, so we have our AI, uh, our player controller here, and um, it's basically a lot of the things that we already need. So we're just going to minimize this. We're going to make an entity. We're going to call it uh, AI controller, and we're going to add a script canvas to it. And so let's start making our script canvas. But we don't need to start from scratch. We can pull up our player controller. So in the previous intensives and in various other tutorials of O3D, um, the common practice is to set up input events uh, through um, your input script stuff, um, file new input bindings. Um, and then you plug into those events by connecting the event, forward, back, left, right, jump, whatever your inputs are set to. And then when you click those inputs as the player, they then do functionality, which is take the input, the movement, you know, forward, back, left, right, and add it to a variable. Um, and in the tutorial, then you take that variable and you pass it across through reference to the, your unit, which is... Um, our guy here by the floor, saying, hey, you're going to move forward and left or back and right or just forward or not left or whatever. Excuse me. Um, so 
all we really need to do is control shift save to save new and go basic AI controller. And I guess uh, just for the sake of tutorials, I'm going to go put it in basic AI recast. And here we go. So we don't need the set camera follow target because that's related to the player. So we can get rid of this. And we don't need input handlers because we're the AI and we are going to determine our input via our minds. Uh, so that can go. I'm going to get rid of all of this debugging stuff that I was using for that tutorial. Um, and now we have what was the um, forward back left right logic and the jump. Um, a nice little uh, feature that you can do is highlight these guys and click disable and they will stop giving you problems if they're just floating out there and lingering. And likewise here if you just disable the first one it'll go down the branch all the way to the end and make it so that everything is fine because if you click save nothing happens but if I for example take this input move and click save you'll get a warning. So you can simply just disable and everything's fine. So what are we going to do now? Well, first and foremost, we kind of have to set up a bit of our things. So like I had said, we're going to have one master, uh, I want to say Detroit, uh, I hate the word departure. Uh, uh, oh, it's in, um, I'm going to take the recast out of our thing and put it in level. There we go, easier. Um, Oh my god, detour, detour. <laughs> We're having a, a centralized detour uh, navigator. So then I can go over here and I can go uh, nav mesh. Um, and then I'm going to expose that publicly so that I can um, point it to our guy there. Um, and then we're going to want uh, some patrol points because uh, in order to do this tutorial I wanted to just do a small patrol AI um, because once you know how to do patrol AI you can start expanding into almost anything else for AI. So we're going to start with an array um, because we want to have more than one point of uh, uh, patrol points and they're going to just be um, entities because uh, we're going to just make some prefabs and make them pins. Uh, so we got our patrol points. We're going to expose that to the component as well. Um, so we've got our patrol points. We've got our reference to our nav mesh. We've got our target unit. We've got the input that we want to do. So we're kind of started ready to, to do this. Um, so auto recast, you know, we've got our stuff and it's tracking our on navigation mesh updated and, and doing these things. Um, but we actually don't really want to do any more processing here on the auto recast. This is just a utility to, to get the nav mesh started. So really what we want to do is on graph start here, we have our reference to nav mesh. So we can basically just, well, in this case, I'll just copy paste. We can just get this on navigation mesh updated event over here. But the way that the open 3D engine works is that we are now addressing the event to ourself, this AI controller, but we don't have a recast navigation notification bus on us. What we actually want to do is get our reference to nav mesh and point there. So now when we do this, uh, we're saying, hey, on the nav mesh, uh, I'm connecting to this event and so I can see what's happening here. Um, so now we're in our basic AI controller, we've got our nav mesh, we've got our graph start and everything here, and well, now we can know on our AI when the nav mesh actually exists and can start using it. So I'm going to make a little boolean here and go nav exists. And over here go set nav exists to true. And so now our AI controller can kind of uh, stay dormant until it's actually valid to do some stuff. So we're going to uh, get this input move out of the way, go equals equals down enter. Um, to get the node, uh, we can hold Alt and click value A to get rid of that. We can bring nav exists into it and drop it in as a ref so we don't have to get and then line it and then do the things. Simplified uh, equals true. So true equals true equals true. So then now you've got your true to nav exists or your false nav doesn't exist. Of course, in this case, because we're ticking, if nav doesn't exist, we're, we're not going to control the AI. <laughs> like, why, why would we do that? So now we have nav exists true. So here we begin with basically everything. Um, now, this is on tick. So on tick is where we're using the AI to then go move forward, move forward, move forward, move forward, move forward, move forward, left, move forward, left, move forward, left, you know, and keep telling instantly tick by tick by tick by tick what to do. So 
we're not actually in this place supposed to query for a path because we would query for a path literally every tick <laughs> 60 times a second give me a path a new path so what we actually want to do is step back up um, to our startup to kind of get the gears rolling so we want our next destination and we want um, a array of um, waypoints, which are simply uh, vector threes. Now we can get into it a little bit. When you ask for a path between A and B, so A is the on graph start and B is nav exists, and we have this barrier in the way. When you ask for a path from A to B, it's going to draw a line from A all the way through to B and go, oh wait, there's this notification bus window in the way. I have to turn and go around it. Pathfinding, whoa, <laughs> well, you're just describing pathfinding. What happens though, is that it then drags, uh, draws a straight trace line up to the edge where it needs to turn, then sets a waypoint, and then sets a line to the next place, sets a waypoint, and then makes a new line to that final place and sets a waypoint. Now, that last waypoint is our next destination. So we've got our route. So what we're gonna do is on start, just before the nav mesh stuff, it doesn't really matter. Um, we're gonna go uh, get first element. And then we're gonna drag in our patrol points. So very simple, we now have uh, the very first patrol point in the list. <laughs> And then we're going to add that to our next destination. So now the only destination we know about is the first patrol point. And now we're joining, we're connecting the nav mesh notification. After the nav mesh exists now, we can go find path between entities, in this case because we have uh, our, our unit and we have our next destination. So, uh, and uh, you know, in this case now we see uh, we need a detour navigation request bus. So the source isn't us, we're just the AI controller. We wanna go back to referring to the nav mesh, exactly like we had of, uh, done up here. Uh, if you had the detour navigation um, component on your unit or on your AI controller, for example, you wouldn't have to worry about this. So that's kind of why they, you can do both. Um, but in this case, I don't see why not. So um, then we're going to go next destination to the destination, like the end point. Uh, the start point is going to be our target unit because that's where they're starting. And now we'll have these waypoints. So ta-da, I already made the variable for us. Um, just for the sake of cleanliness, we're going to bring this over, I guess. And now we have path, uh, find the path between entities. So just to start, we're going to go print. I always start with print because it's in my mind, but the actual answer is to start with get size. Excuse me, my mouse is falling. There we go. Get size of the waypoints. The number goes out. Uh, we have to turn this back to value, and we put the number of the we put the number of the size in, and we go waypoints uh, count. Just <laughs> count. <laughs> Um, and so let's just do this so that we can be sure that we're stepping through the process, uh, you know, in a proper way. Go to the console. I'm going to purposely clear all that out and let's click play. Nav mesh done processing, but nothing happened. Oh, well, guess what? We didn't, uh, point our AI controller to even, uh, be an AI controller. <laughs> um, always important to remember that part. So here we go. Nice, uh, straightforward. Nav mesh is our recast. Oops. Nav mesh is our recast, and target unit is our AI unit. Um, and we don't need to do jump sound, so let's try this again. <laughs> See, this is why you do debug, de debugging as you go. Uh, entities from new row, nav mesh done processing, blah, 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 enter game mode. Hmm. We've got our AI unit, we've got our AI controller, basic AI controller, recast AI unit entity. Nav mesh done processing, exit game mode, that was the early one. Entities blah, 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 nav mesh done processing, exit in game mode. So let's see here. Uh, we're looking at the nav mesh, which has the recast on it. 
Oh, <laughs> very important. <laughs> hey, why don't we add the patrol points to the thing? See, oh man, <laughs> game development is just nuts. You always think the solution is something complicated, and it never is. Okay, so we're going to start uh, with this first patrol point, like right here. And then we're going to go over to that far patrol point over there. So we're going to do uh, shader ball three. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so what was happening is that it was crashing on get first element because there was none. <laughs> so I mean, a good thing if you don't if you don't want this to work, do that. Or if you do want it to work, skip it. <laughs> um, here we go. Waypoints count one. We've got some waypoints. What a relief. Um, for some reason, I don't think that the way, like if there's only one, then it should only go straight for it. I think it should go past, but we'll see, uh, I guess. We have the waypoints. We are getting a path. Uh, let's see what we can do with it then. So we've got our waypoint stuff. Uh, well, see, this can just be a commented out thing, so you can just go disable. And if you need to see the waypoints count again in the future, you can just re-enable it. Uh, we have our waypoints. We have our path. Um, we can go waypoint dest. So let's go and... Uh, Hmm. This is where I'd go, like, I'd make an event that says, you know, get get new waypoint or something. Um, let's see what we can do here. Uh, so we're going to go, and we've got our waypoints list. So we're going to go um, get first element from waypoints. So we're just getting the first waypoint in the list. And now that we have it, we're going to go... Um, uh, erase, yes, and then we're going to go uh, waypoints, and we're going to go key zero, and this function takes the waypoints, removes the key, and then just gives us a new uh, list, so we actually have to put that back into the waypoints so that we know that we removed. So um, if this were a queue, you would be dequeuing, and so it would take the element, erase it from the list, and then give you the element. Um, but we don't have that. Uh, we have basic function. Uh, so now we've got the waypoints back to where they are. Uh, we've got our waypoint waypoint destination. Oh, um, whoops. We just need a vector three, not a, an MTD. Waypoint destination um, right here. So then we go. Uh, we've got our first element. It's now not in there. Um, and then, uh, good. So um, now we have our control unit. So nav exists. We now have our waypoint destination that we need to move towards. And now we have to get our AI to actually communicate that uh, down the line. So um, let me see. The unit's perspective is always... Uh, um, compass north, south, east, west uh, to the world units. Uh, so we never need to really worry too much about um, doing calculations based off of camera angles and stuff like that. So what we can do is we can go, um, what is it? Um, get <clears throat> world translation to see where we are. And this is the AI controller, so we actually want the target unit, because this is all relative to where our unit is. So we now know where they are. And then we have our waypoint destination. So then we can go direction two, from and two, and we've got our waypoint destination right there. And we're doing scale to one, so this is a, a normal. <clears throat> so it's a direction, not a um, like a line to it. Um, yeah, see, the length is the line, but we're only making it one, so it's just a, a measure. Um, and so we've got our direction two. We have our move input. And I think it should be so simple as to say that direction two will be 
direction time, no, 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 direction two, yeah, no, that's fine. Move input. Ah, yes, we need to flatten this. Um, so then we're going to go um, extract properties. And the only direction we don't want is Z, which is up, down. So X and Y says forward, back, left, left and right, and everything else just gets squashed. Uh, so then we can go from values for vector 2, yeah, and go X and Y. And we, I guess, can put that on move input. Um, and if that's the case, then we can probably now go to here and put our input move uh, going on. So now uh, the direction from our waypoint is what's going to give us our direction. And what we can also do, uh, for example, is just before this, we're going to go, um, we've got our, our world translation for our uh, current position. And so we're going to go distance, distance, uh, vector three distance. Uh, oops. The translation from us to the waypoint destination. Uh, if that distance is, we're going to call this a uh, waypoint success threshold. Um, oh, if that distance is less than or equal to waypoint success thr th threshold, we know that we've arrived at the destination. So we have to do some extra stuff. If not, uh, if it's false, then we still have some time, some place to go. Um, so we're going to go, 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 go to that place. And the moment we get within the waypoint success threshold, we can start reprocessing this step again. Um, so for example, we could go out from here and we get the first element, we erase, and then uh, well, see, th we have to do a little bit more. We have to go uh, um, get size, waypoints, get size is greater than zero. Um, that means we have a path. So get the first element, erase, blah, 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 blah. If not, this means that our path is concluded. We've gotten to our um, destination. So what we can then do is get our new patrol point. <laughs> so we're almost there. We're getting there. Um, so let's go out from this to here. These would be better served if you had events and, and proper calls and stuff. Um, but we're going to say that that's to get this guy going um, over here. So we can uh, group group these and go group, and we can go uh, process next waypoint. Um, so we have our unit. We're driving them to the waypoint. When we get to the waypoint, we're getting the new waypoint. But then there's the point where we get to our destination. So then um, at this point, I think what we want to do is go uh, patrol index is zero. And that's because we're just getting our very first one. Uh, if we wanted, we can even be very uh, concrete and go set patrol, uh, set patrol, <laughs> patrol index to zero and then enter all this stuff. So we know we're starting in the right place every single time. Um, or, well, we can even skip this get first element and go get element <laughs> just for the sake of it. <laughs> um, patrol points. Because basically we're going to be able to um, connect. Uh, where's the next destination? View. Um, 
we're going to be able to basically use these again. So we're going to go over here and we're going to paste and we're going to go um, group and we're going to go process next patrol destination. Again, this is all re really messy and cruddy. Like you, you wouldn't really want to be doing this too hard, um, but uh, we'll, we'll, we can do it. Um, so let's do this a little bit differently. Let's go here and go uh, uh, add patrol index and one and one. So we're getting element patrol index from patrol points, adding it to next de destination. Uh, we are adding, we're incrementing the patrol index by, oh, it's by one. It's not displaying because we have to uh, refresh the graph editor. Um, patrol index. Uh, then um, if uh, patrol, oh, no, no, um, greater than or equals to, I'm going to just do patrol index as a reference so that it's cleaner. Um, greater than or equals to get size uh, patrol points is the container. Don't do that. So if patrol index is greater than the size of the thing, we're going to set patrol uh, set patrol index to zero again. So this is a looping one. You could do reverse if you wanted ping pong logic and stuff. Uh, but again, that's unnecessary for the current tutorial as it stands because that's just uh, detailing. Um, I'm going to put these guys within and make it a little bit bigger. Um, so we're incrementing the patrol index. Uh, if it gets too high, we're uh, decrementing it back to the first patrol. So it's a loop. And then we're going to go uh, oh, uh, then we're going to just start again the next time we process the thing. So let's see, can I plug this in up here at some point? No, I don't think it's that necessary. Um, so we can go uh, after this one, we then want to process the new waypoint for the next uh, generation of waypoints. <laughs> oh, come on. <laughs> there we go. Um, this is a little messy. I'm, I'm already saying ahead of time. This is this is a little messy. Uh, can I? Oops. I'm gonna see. Let's see. Okay. So this is the handle patrol points. This is the handle waypoints. This is our process the unit. Okay. <laughs> Again, thanks for all your patience. Uh, direction from uh, buh, 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 to waypoint. Oh, you want to get uh, get world trans. Oh, I have it right here. Here we go. Come on. There we go. True, false, two. Okay. From where we're at to where we're going, from values input move. This uh, is just the direction input. The unit has speed and stuff like that, so they'll go. And then, who we? Let's see if this begins to work. Might have been worth trying a little bit more thoroughly. Oh look! So our guy's trying to go to the first nav point, um, but for some reason, oh, he's not finding the success, and that's because. We haven't set the um, the threshold yet. <laughs> it would have been go good to set a default. Oh, sorry, I'm not looking at. There we go. We have. Oh, and I didn't even. I didn't even expose it either. Um, waypoint success threshold. Uh, let's give it uh, 0.3 of a meter um, from component. So now I don't have to actually set it. And here, our guy goes. Oh, geez, he's going really fast. Okay, let's uh, start 
figuring some of this out. Um, so we're going, uh, bah, 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 find path between entities. Oh, lol, <laughs> we need this guy down here too. <laughs> That's part of our issue. What we want is all of these guys. Come on, get rid of that, get rid of this, to go here. Uh, no, 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 no. What am I saying? What am I saying? What am I saying? Those are correct. Um, this one is incorrect. So we've got our new path destination, and now we need it to actually make the path, then process the, the things. So, I mean, you could arguably put this in that side. Um, okay, good. So we're there, get size, uh, greater than first element, blah, 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 blah. Let's see if this works a little bit better. He's going there, but he's not doing. So let's go into this. Um, oh, <laughs> because nothing's going to that one. Ah, uh, jeez. Um, let's see. Less than or equal to our... Waypoint destination, yes, is the waypoints. We're processing next waypoint, get first thing, erase. Where's our logic to? Less than the thing, direction to, extract from values, input move, uh, get size, great. Okay, here we go, less than, all right. So the waypoints are no longer in action. <laughs> Now let's go and get a new patrol destination. And then that will go through the logic, hit the thing. Slay cyclical. Ah, oh, yeah, I'm seeing this here. Uh, but that's only because. Yeah, this is annoying. See, this is why you would use an event, because you don't have to have these connected. You just have an event that says process next one. Okay, you know. <laughs> We're going to do that. So we're going to go to script events, and we're going to make this one, uh, well, we can go pathfinding events, and then we can put this in AI events category. And so ideally, no matter what your events are, you'd keep calling them AI events, even if it's pathfinding, even if it's detour, even if it's whatever. Um, we are going to be looking on the address type of entity ID, which means that we're looking at a specific entity. And now we're going to say um, next waypoint and next destination. And I don't think we need to put any parameters or things because these are actually just going to be triggers for us. Uh, basically, I recast, uh, re, uh, pathfinding events. Save. Good. Let's see if we can clean this up a bit more. So we're going to go back up here and we're going to go um, update destination. Oh, what did I do? What did I call it? <laughs> destination. Next destination. So receive next destination means that we are going to, when someone tells us to do next destination, we're going to start here, which is just get it. Um, and so then that's going to go through the thing. And then uh, we can go um, waypoint. Uh, bo -bo -bo, what did I call it? Next waypoint. Receive next waypoint. So then we can go here. And we can put that there. And let's see. So we have. Oh, why was that's probably was part part of the problem there. Um, so we have our. Uh, we don't even need any of this. Let's see. Uh, so our patrol index will be zero. We're going to get our patrol point zero from that. Set our next destination to that. Uh, increment our patrol index, so the next one we get will be that. Uh, we get the size just to make sure. If it's too big, we'll re-loop. I see. But what we'll want to do is uh, get this element again. Um, 
because we've got a new destination. No, no, no. No, no, no. That's what, what am I saying? The index will apply the next time we go. So then that's fine. Um, then we find the path. And now we have our waypoints. So we can go next waypoint and send it this time. And we're sending it to ourselves. So now we're, we're hearing it. We're doing it. And now we're hearing it. And then we're getting first element here, which then gives us our waypoints. And we could also just go, uh, again, for sanity's sake, we can go has path. <laughs> um, and so uh, has path will happen here. Um, set has path to true, and then find the next waypoint. Um, maybe we don't want this here. No, no, no. I, I, I it, it makes sense, but, but no, we're going to go a little bit more granular. Um, if we have any thing, we're going to go has path, set has path to true. Come on. Come on. So it is got is greater than, yes. Set has path out to get first element, blah, 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 blah. We're going to go down into here. We're going to interrupt this with one more equals 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 to close this. Has path. Where's has path? Reference. You know, these. this is just a switch, an if else, if else, if else, if else. Uh, it nav exists and we have a path, then we will process and no, no sooner than that. Uh, next waypoint, we do have a path. We're going to do all that stuff. This time we've hit the new waypoint and now there is no more path. So we're going to set has path to false. And then we're going to go uh, next destination. We're going to send next destination um, to self. And so then next destination is going to go back to here. We're going to find our element uh, with the new index that we did last frame. <laughs> uh, increment it again, make sure we didn't overshoot it, reset it if we did, and then just process the path that we figured out that was valid up here. It's a bit of a contrived way of doing it, but and then we do the next waypoint. We go through here, we do all this stuff. OK, so actually, let's just go right out into connect. We got nav exists now, and then let's go next destination. So now we've got a nice, reliable pattern of using the actual mechanisms, even in startup. We can only path when we're actually doing it. Uh, when our waypoint success is through, we can next waypoint, send that. And if not, we can just run to that waypoint. Um, let's see. <laughs> Much cleaner now, as you can see. So that's a good lesson, I guess, on its own. Um, maybe he'll do it. Oh, no, he's not moving at all. Hmm. Script canvas parsing failed. Control shift C. Are we missing some saves? No. Uh, if I click save, there's no parsing issue here. Auto precast. If I click save, there's no issue here. Basic AI controller. Did we expose some new things to our guy? No, we just have the same stuff there. AI controller has the success recast AI unit. We start graph on navigation changed. OK. Here we can start doing some simplified little things here. We can go um, print, uh, getting next patrol. Save. Getting next patrol. Uh, patrol points, next destination. So we're going to go out here and we're going to go uh, get entity name and entity name 
and then we're going to do another print print uh, uh, next destination name and for the sanity of ourselves we're going to go and we're going to call this shader ball one enter and then this is shader ball three enter uh, we're going to go back to the AI controller just to make sure that we actually oh the patrol points got reset again this is why that's so annoying okay <laughs> shader ball one on here shader ball three on here that should help us a lot more. Uh, so yeah, a lot of the times when you're changing variables out here on the public thing, if for example, this patrol points were just above this waypoint success threshold, which it was, and now the waypoint success threshold took over and bumped it down, the actual weird thing, and this is not, that's not intentional, it needs to be fixed down the line. Um, the patrol points get bumped down, but all of their metadata, like what they were holding is for index you know zero one and two so index two but now they're on index three so it resets everything doesn't have any prior knowledge and if they were of similar composition like not a list but if they were just a entity unit and then a number or a bool and a number the the new variable will have the metadata of the previous thing so if this waypoint successful threshold was a number and we had a boolean here before it's going to say couldn't convert boolean to a number and it's like why when would you try and do that this is when so a good thing to do when this um, happens is to you know re put in all of the the variables and stuff and then give your editor a small scrub of restart because um, it'll recompile, it'll re uh, get all of the little metadata and stuff like that. Um, what often happens is you don't know that that happened, and so all of those variables just get wiped, and you didn't, you don't know that they're changed, and so you're trying to test, and weird, weird shit is happening. And no, it's not that weird stuff's happening. Sorry, you didn't make a mistake. It's just uh, confusing you. It's gaslighting you. It's making mistakes for you to think that you made. Um, so here we're back. Everything should be clean and tidy. If we go back to our uh, AI controller, we've got our shader balls and everything uh, still remaining there. Nothing got reset. Um, so I'm going to go in and our AI is still not moving. What are you doing? Next destination name, shader ball one, getting next patrol, exit game mode. So let's uh, do a little bit of further basic AI controller, some further debugging. So we have the right destination. Oh, <laughs> well, here we go. If it's false, uh, then the patrol index is fine. And we just need to find the path and we don't have to. Gosh, <laughs> logic, huh? There we go. And now look, they went over to the destination and now they're coming back and now they, oh, see, look. They're trying to go to uh, to the waypoints. Wow, they're going fast. But as you can see, um, des des destination, shader ball, getting next patrol. So we can start to, it's working now. I mean, the character controls are terrible. <laughs> um, you know, we may want to take our uh, AI unit and turn the speed down. To, I'm going to do a tutorial on better controls and handling. Um, I don't want to jump the gun here. so. We're going to just go for a much more ga gradual movement. Okay, we're going to go <laughs> real bad here. Uh, we're going to go like five. Um, and linear dampening, we're going to just go one. Again, I want to talk about these at greater depth to actually get a, a proper outcome, but I wasn't expecting this to be so, so embarrassing. <laughs> um, AI yeah, controller because I put up the, the dampening, I need to put up the thing. All right, this is why I wanted to show in a different tutorial. All right, so now our guardian is going around this corner, hitting that waypoint, knowing where to go, going back to our destination, or to our next destination, identifying that it's there. Um, it's overshooting the index, so it's resetting the index back to zero. And so then it's going now to the waypoint that was first, then around the corner of the next waypoint, and here we are back to our waypoint. 
Ta-da! Wow, what a wordy one. That was a bit of a <laughs> a pain. The pathfinding logic is one of those things that it's like, once you've got it done, it makes a lot of sense, but just cl clarifying all those variables at first. So, this wasn't the full extent of the tutorial. I'm actually going to go to what do we do now? So, in regards to the way that this basic AI controller works, we're doing everything like our play, player controller did, except that where we were using joysticks to tell the direction of the input move, they're using intention plus uh, some math for direction to get the same data to feed it into the unit. So as far as the unit is concerned, everybody is using joystick or nobody is using joystick. It really doesn't matter. So. That allows us now to consider what our AI controller wants to do, because this now is the brain that determines the actions of the body. Um, just like you're the brain that determines the action of your hero, we need to have the AI controller able to do things. Now, I'm not going to get into that in this tutorial. You're a game developer. You can do it. Um, but this can go in so far as to just be that you can click control shift save and you can go uh, like in my case i wanted to use um i wanted to reference uh the original Mega Man games uh where you had a uh, side to side wall bonker ai <laughs> and now all you have to do is tell it to go only left until it hits a wall or a, a, ga a precipice, and then only right after it's changed directions, and just do that over and over and over. And if you wanted as well, <clears throat> you'd then have um, a thing that checks to see if Mega Man is standing on the platform that, that your side-to-side -side bonkers going on. And if so, then it could, in my case, uh, hold shift to sprint, <laughs> and then go faster, because that's what that thing does in Mega Man. Um, but that's not even the extent of what this tutorial is meant to be. That's supposed to put you at ease if you have very basic AI needs. But using this system of command, you can then start taking something like this patrol behavior. And if you will, I'm going to just summarize it like this. You can, sorry, I'm going to just go out to these guys and just delete and get this guy out and delete. Delete. You can basically make uh, a, a state machine or an advanced learning thing where this entire patrol behavior would be uh, its own node that's like um, uh, AI decided to patrol node. And then it basically works like this, where um, you start your advanced AI out, you make sure you have all of the things, the navigation exists, your character has stats and has uh, perception, awareness, you know, a vision cone and all that stuff. And then when it says, oh, there's no enemies in your vision cone, you know, you have nothing to do, then it would go down its path and it would go, yeah, uh, do the patrol. And then if it's like, oh, you saw an enemy, it would just, it would just break out because it's a state machine and it would start doing different behavior. Um, and this is how we start getting into an advanced AI. So here's where I'm now segueing. Kythera AI is the only O3DE uh, AI gem currently. Um, it does read to be very feature rich, which sounds great. Um, but I'm noticing here that there's a message that says we no longer support individual downloads of the gem. So they're trying to orient themselves around uh, enterprise. So if you are a studio and want to use Kythera AI, they want to get in contact with you, discuss uh, pricing, uh, licensing, and all those things. I covered similar things with the Wise Gem tutorial. So you don't necessarily need to buckle. This is the only solution, unfortunately. So what you do beyond this will have to be proprietary, or hopefully uh, the community will have supplemented it by the time you're watching this video. So I wanted to propose some alternatives. Um, Behavior Tree, this article uh, is from 2014 from a developer of um, Project Zomboid, a game I know and love and has been around for a long time. Um, and he's covering how to look at behavior trees, not just how they work, but the, the ideas you have to hold while 
navigating through a behavior tree. Behavior trees are industry standard, 100% across the board industry standard. Um, Unreal has it built into their system um, and it is industry standard. Um, this does everything you need, um, starting from a top hierarchy down through all sorts of lists of conditional needs and all sorts of considerations and stuff down to execution nodes. And through that, you can go, uh, for example, am I hungry? Do I have food? There's no enemies around, so then I'll eat food. Um, and so then it's a sequence. You have to go from left to right. Um, and these are how you start to uh, bring a reason to your AIs. So then, um, for example, in this mechanism, you might have an enemies around node, not uh, no enemies around. And in order to access no enemies around, you just do an inverter. So enemies around is false. So then inverter says uh, no enemies around is true. And so then you have that same sequence. Now, the fallback of these kinds of systems, or um, the more simple version with uh, state machine driven, you have to author every single one of these and author the pattern by which it goes from one to the next to the next. You need to be sure that everything is going in the right order and that when you're branching down 700 trees like this, that all the logic still comes back up the tree in the order and the patterns and stuff that you need them to go. Now this starts to go crazy in a game uh, with advanced AI because this tree just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And in fact, when the game systems actually process this, if unlock door is an entire uh, complicated ar arrangement of other sub behavior trees, it literally copy pastes the entire behavior tree right there. So if there's, yeah, like there's a, if there's an unlock door somewhere else, if there's unlock doors all over the logic, because you know, there's different times that you need to unlock the door, it literally is going to copy and paste the code into that, into that, into that, into that. It's nuts. So it comes with its drawbacks. And basically where the drawbacks come is size and complexity and um, when you start getting um, too elaborate for a human mind to really comprehend. So what else is there then? Well, there is GOP, Goal-Oriented Action Planning. Uh, this was a, a process, a, a style of um, AI that was made famous by the game Fear, uh, First Encounter Assault Recon. Um, that game is notorious for having some of the most um, compelling and engaging uh, enemy gunfighting, wherein uh, enemies will do fire support, they'll flank, they'll uh, you know do grenade things to sweep, uh, they'll flank in a way that involves them literally navigating through seven quarters of the whole level to come up behind you because the funny thing about it is that they weren't actually that smart, is that if there were no other flanking positions except for the one flank position that's behind you, it just has to get there anyway. <laughs> so then that's how it works and people love it. It was so compelling. So what is the difference? Well, GOP is uh, a form of pathfinding. In fact, it's almost exactly like A star pathfinding, but rather than finding a path through um, space with various struggles of weight depending on uh, what path you, you tra traverse, you know, going over ice or going over lava or something versus just regular ground. Um, it's called heuristics. The going over la lava is a heavier weight. So then it's like, no, that is not the path of res least resistance. That's a huge path of tons of resistance. Well, GOP does that through uh, goals. So ultimately, what a goal may be is something like get wheat. And as we're seeing here, this is a state machine thing. So, you know, you have get wheat. And so get wheat involves going to move and then move says, well, my last objective was get weak wheat. So now I'm moving to, uh, well, you'd probably find a find wheat. <laughs> and then when you're at find wheat, it would say, no, it's not time to move anymore. It's time to either harvest or pick up wheat, right? So then you have these very rigid angular passages of, of potential and every time something else has to access harvest wheat you need to make some sort of conditional uh, line to it. GOP however 
is pathfinding. So all of these lines are gope. <laughs> these are something else. These are nodes, they're actions. That's the A in gope. So the goal ends up being get wheat. But get wheat has uh, an outcome, which is you now have wheat, and has a, uh, a requirement, which means you have to be in the presence of wheat, uh, let's say. And as we read up here, you know, one of the options is get the scythe, harvest the wheat, and then get the wheat. But if you don't have the scythe, go to the silo, harvest the wheat, and get the wheat. Or if you don't have a silo or a scythe, you can use your hands to harvest the wheat to get the wheat. So using your hands has a heuristic saying like this is a really inefficient way to harvest wheat. So it wouldn't it wouldn't dominate find scythe. It would fall behind. But if find scythe is invalid, then find scythe just pops off the pathfinding list and well, some of these start to fill in. So what you end up starting to get is uh, this intricate thing where when the path starts, it's finding all sorts of the possible ways that it can go, and it's excluding all of the paths that are invalid until it has a list of all of the possible ones by which it can start doing uh, waiting uh, checks, like is this better or worse, um, and all this stuff. And so then, interestingly enough, they're saying that almost all GOP systems only need these three state machines and all of the GOP activity outside of it. So you either go to, to assure that you're at some point or another, uh, use a smart object, which allows them to do something more complicated than go to, and then animate, which allows us to know that they're doing these two other things. <laughs> so then, yeah, fear's finite state machine. Like literally the, the most world-renowned GOP impl implementation uses three actions on top of a complicated structure of evaluating your environment to then um, know what you can and can't do all at once and then pick the path. So I just said something, knowing what you can and can't do all at once. GOP in particular uh, uses a world state awareness to uh, evaluate these paths. So it has to know what items it has. It has to know what things it can see. It has to know what things it can hear. It has to know what its health is and what it, you know, what it is fully capable of in every single extent of its function. It has to have a state of that, just a little, a snapshot of that total persistent world around it. And through that, it's able to just pick by the conditions, by these uh, uh, arbitrary actions in scattered in a scattered pool, a nice outcome that ends up being find scythe, harvest wheat, get wheat. With behavior trees, uh, there's a limited priority, a static priority of left to right. So this sequence, am I hungry? Do I have food? There's no enemies around and eat food. That's great, but where on the greater branch is this one prioritized to be? Because if enemies are around, that will probably be ahead in priority because obviously don't die from enemies is way more important than maybe I should eat something. But in my personal experiences, there's a situation where starving <laughs> will kill you faster than the enemy you see but in this situation, it won't factor starvation in the you're seeing an enemy. So then you have to do a thing bef like before the seeing the enemy, before the eating food that says, should I eat food before I do these other high priority things? Because this is an edge case where food is more detrimental than the enemy seeing me and engaging me in fight in fighting. So now you have two things that now involve evaluating foodness and they trump other stuff that might be important to have in priority. So that's where they're talking about complexity of um, authoring. When it starts getting to this point where there's ambiguous answers as to what is the true right answer, trees start to erode away because then it's up to the singular author of the AI to determine that priority. 
Whereas with pathfinding, it is using path of least resistance. So it's going to get just a good path with all of those factors considered ahead of time. So it's going to consider how hostile is this enemy? Has it already hit me a bunch of times kind of thing? And am I going to starve to death? So then if I'm going to starve to death is like absolute hypercritical, it can give the weight of like a gajillion or like minus a gajillion so that nothing is lighter in the path to do it. Um, and so those are some subtleties that I'm finding are very necessary to know as I've been breaching into my project, as in fact, we're going for a very uh, complex AI. So in the GOP structure, uh, creating a very competent array of actions is a very, very essential piece. But the reason why you want the comprehensive array of actions is so that you can get an extremely nuanced outcome of the path that seems to prove uh, an awareness of the world greater than, oh, is there an enemy? I'm going to pri prioritize that over anything. I'm going to run off the ledge because there's, a pro uh, there's an enemy in, in my view. And that's where the perceived intellect comes in from GOPE, is that if a behavior tree is making a bad decision as to the efficiency of how to get through the behavior, that will simply be the, the behavior that it takes if it's unoptimal or if it comes out with boring or drab outcomes, that's all you're going to get. With the goal-oriented programming, it's harder to get those quality outcomes, but as you refine your pool, the quality outcomes will become more and more abundant and unfortunately more black boxed in the sense that you can't discern exactly how it's doing it or exactly what it's like, why it's all coming together. But then that's, um, the ultimate struggle of the AI author. And hopefully one way or another, you can do a lot with it. Whew. So I hope that was a very, very deep overview of everything we're doing regarding pathfinding, controlling AIs, and properly uh, expanding and scaling to the needs that we have. And with that, you should be able to have both your player character from previous intensives and your AIs able to both be um, derivative of the same base unit, which allows you to just only have to make one, uh, and allows you to have a rich degree of, of complex uh, motion and action that you want to give your player can also be given to your AIs. So if we're looking at Dark Souls, the, our guy right here would be charging me using high commitment combat, you know, do uh, random varied attacks that can interrupt in the middle and move to a new attack or, you know, follow through with five subsequent follow-up attacks. Um, and that all can be driven from what you learned today. So thank you so much. I hope that this wasn't too much, too crazy. Um, it was quite an intensive, I would say. Um, but with that, you should be able to command all this stuff. Uh, one last note, as I was saying about both in the player controller uh, thing, is that you can use your controller to highlight your player and command them to move. Well, guess what? Now you can command them with this pathfinding to move to your pointed destination. So now you have the means to uh, highlight and select your characters as your player controller, you know, put them on a list of, you know, these are the guys that I want to send the move command to or whatever. And then you right click on the screen, the screen, you know, sends a ray to the world space and says, hey, AIs that you're selected, you know, all seven of you, uh, your commander said to run over here. And over here happens to be this shader ball. And lo and behold, they're going there. So um, this isn't just for action combat. This isn't just for all those things. Of course, you need to build your character and your controllers around the needs of your project. Thanks so much. And here's to another intensive. See you then. Bye, you guys. Oops. Time to oops my way into the... Oh, come on. There we go. Time to oops my way. Bye.